Sister Dorothy, right quick here. We, again, this is stuff we've all been reading. Over the last couple of weeks, a number of stories have come out about the tension that exists between the Congressional Black Caucus and the White House. Google these stories, they're everywhere, about the tension between the CBC, folk who we have elected for years, many of them, to represent our interest in Congress, tension between the CBC and the White House. There are a number of, there are a number of persons who have suggested, from the New York Times, to the Washington Post, to the LA Times, folk who have suggested that as long as, and the President has echoed this himself in his own interviews, the argument goes like this, as long as he knows that he is beloved by the masses of black people, am I right about this? And has an approval rating in the 86, 90 percent tile. As long as he knows he's beloved by black people, he can circumvent elected officials, appointed officials, when and if he chooses to, because he knows he can come right to us through Steve Harvey, through Tom Joyner, through Michael Baisden, through Russ Parr, through Doug Banks, all friends of mine, he picks up the phone, he calls into these black radio shows, he makes his case, but the tension on a legislative agenda that focuses on black people hangs in the balance. This tension between him and the CBC is real. Talk to me about this notion that he can circumvent that tension and come right to the people and get cover. Well, first of all, I think it is real. I was in Washington two weeks ago and I was talking to some of the black leadership, and they were really telling me about cons concerns they had. And they said when they bring their concerns, it just kind of gets slapped back. There's no really respect. If you notice when the black, when black, when black caucus came up and they began to talk about jobs, he just dismissed them. Gutierrez, one Latina. Guy fans started talking about what he wanted and he got embraced. He's not fear for other black caucus. I think that a black people, have to understand that we have really, in terms of black political empowerment, since President Obama been in, have been diminished. Because black people now are embracing him and saying, don't do nothing. But on the local level, they're not voting. Because they think if they put somebody in, they're going to do the same thing. Black political empowerment is really being diminished because- So what's going to happen, so what's going to happen here in Illinois? There's a very tight Senate race, as we well know, a tight Senate race here in Illinois for the seat that Senator Obama, President Obama, used to have in the Illinois State Senate. He had the seat, runs for the White House and wins. Roland Burris gets appointed by the former governor, Blagojevich. He has announced, Roland Burris, that he's not going to run again. There's a very tight race, neck and neck, nobody black in the race, two white men running against each other. So there's going to be no black diversity at the moment in the United States Senate. But two black men out of Illinois, Republican, Democrat, running against each other, two major parties at least, two black, two white men running against each other. What would happen? How would it shake up the body politic if that seat were lost by Democrats? That well, seat. Let me first say it doesn't matter which you get in, the Republican or the Democrat, black folks have lost. Because black people don't feel that we have a right to have someone in the Senate. You can be Democrat or Republican. As long as we've been, we've been in this country, we don't have representation in the Senate. And when we get one, we're still celebrating the first or the only. So it really doesn't matter. But I want to tell you about the politics in Illinois right now. Black people in Illinois and in Chicago, we are very angry. We're angry for several reasons. Uh, we have an opportunity now to appoint a lieutenant governor. The black person who was next in line should have that seat. But because we don't count, because people take us for granted, they just went past them and going to reach over and get somebody else. Black people are really, you, Chicago is going to surprise a lot of people because right now it's not the party, it's the person who's for the people. Mm. Dr. West, let me ask you, one, one second, Jesse, I'm sorry. Mm. Let me, Brother West, let me, let me ask you about the fact that, let me, let me rephrase this. There are some who believe that the critique leveled against President Obama. When we have conversations like the ones we're having today where there are certain viewpoints expressed that are challenging to the president, that that, 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 that kind of commentary makes his job more difficult. Mm -hmm. it, 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 it gives solace to and energy to a right-wing movement that he's already up against every day. What about that notion that, that this kind of critique, this kind of commentary, this kind of challenge makes his job more difficult and gives, uh, give, gives, gives some, some heft 
to the right wing argument against him already. No, and I'm, I, I'm, I'm glad you, can you hear me? No, I'm glad you raised that because that's very real. Uh, uh, there are a number of highly misguided right wing white, white brothers and sisters who are engaged in assault and attack right. and could even attempt to kill him. So we have to protect our brother. There's no doubt about that. And we have to keep track of those forces that will lie, degrade, in the same way that we concern with anybody. He is our brother. He needs to be protected. He needs to be respected. But love also leads us to say he needs to be corrected. Corrected when he sides with the strong against the weak. And that's why this gathering is not just significant, but I think the world can see the truth telling that has taken place around this table already with tears flowing in our eyes precisely because we know the level of suffering that's taking place this very moment. I want to just say a quick word, though, about what my dear brother, Minister Louis Farrakhan, was talking about in terms of the forces around Brother Barack Obama. People might recall three years ago in Jamestown, we told folk, anybody who makes it to the Oval Office is going to in some way be predicated on various interests that historically have been indifferent to black people, poor people, and working people. And it's not just white brothers and sisters in the abstract. We're talking about corporate interests. We're talking about Wall Street oligarchs. We're talking about those at the top that have been making billions and billions and billions of dollars when 21% of all America's children live in poverty and 38% of black children live in poverty. This is not just black versus white, we're talking about corporate elites at the highest level. But when you look at the folk around Brother Barack Obama, Tim Geithner, Larry Summers, Goolsby, all of them come out of the Wall Street context. So already it was clear that they have no history of being concerned with poor and working people. Where were the progressive voices, trade union voices, black voices, brown voices, red voices who got him in? Now he can say, well, Brother West, I needed to reassure the establishment, and therefore I had to bring in the folk who helped create the crisis and the mess in the first place. I say, my brother, I love you. It's plausible, but it's not persuasive. It's not persuasive. Same is true on the international scene. America is an empire in relative decline because of corporate greed, because of military overstretch, war in Afghanistan, war in Iraq, drones in Pakistan, and still siding with right-wing forces in Latin America. It's in the culture's in relative decay because if we can put the greed and the lust and keep people so obsessed with their immediate pleasure, you can pacify them, keep them fearful, and never stand up for justice. You can't have a movement for freedom if everybody's obsessed with lust for pleasure. That's why the younger generation is hungry for more than the lust, but all they are getting every day is orgiastic free play, obsession with stimulation, titillation, unconcerned with broader struggles for freedom. That's why our attempt here is really an act of ancestor appreciation. We are here because of Marcus Garvey and Elijah Muhammad and Malcolm X and those persons who love black folk enough so in that particular tradition wanted to tell the truth. We're here because of Frederick Douglass and Ida B. Wells Barnett and Martin King. And you know what? We're here because of nameless, anonymous grandmothers and grandfathers who loved us enough because we are who we are because people loved us. And we're going to love folk from the bottom and spill over even when there are corporate forces around our dear brother that tilts him toward investment bankers. If Jamal and Letitia can be treated with the privilege that investment bankers on Wall Street are, we could be breakdancing right now. We wouldn't even have to have a dog.